Hello and welcome to the next in our interview series with our astronomers here at the Royal Observatory from Greenwich. Uh, we are here in the Octagon Room in Flamsteed House, uh, the oldest building on the site here at the observatory, to talk to uh, Dr. Ed Bloomer, one of the astronomers working on our planetarium here at the observatory. So, hi Ed. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so, what sort of things is it that you actually do running, running the planetarium here? at the observatory? Well, I mean, uh, the astronomers here, we all do uh, different things, we wear many different hats, but in, in terms of the planetarium, uh, the planetarium, if, for people who don't know, it, it is a, an immersive um, audio-visual environment. I suppose you can think of it as being a little bit like a, a strange sort of cinema. Um, but because it surrounds you, and because it allows us to project uh, the night sky around people, it's very immersive. Um, uh, but just projecting the night sky isn't enough. You've got to sort of put these things in context. So. Part of my job is to create programs that show people, uh, and not just as pre-records, but as, as sort of live presentations, uh, take people to different places, show them the relationship between different things uh, in, in the universe. I suppose we've got a whole universe to play with. Um, and, and really try and explain astronomy uh, visually, using audio, uh, showing the relationships between things, and, and presenting data uh, as well. And do you produce these um, planetarium shows effectively from, from scratch, or are you working with some sort of software to, to begin with? Well, there's, I mean, there's different ways to do it. There, there is built-in software that allows, that, that I suppose, in our live presentations, we're very keen on doing live presentations here at the observatory because it's a really good way of getting an astronomer in front of people to talk to them specifically and to react to them. So when we're doing things like that, we're using uh, sort of the built-in software uh, to, it's, it's not, it's not VGAing, but you 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 are you're sort of demonstrating things live. Yeah. Um, uh, but there are some shows where we pre-record sequences or we generate them completely from scratch, and you're talking therefore about sort of three D modelling and things like that, or incorporating real data. Very big part of a very important part of it. Um, so there's different ways of doing it, and we run a, a, a hybrid sort of program here at the observatory because we want we want a lot of variety for people, and we want. Uh, at the same time, to fit in with when we're doing, for instance, education work, we want to be able to fit in with particular learning outcomes and look at the school curricula and, and things like that. So, some things are a bit on rails, some things are a bit more freeform. Um, we want to make sure we've got a, uh, lots of scope for different types of learning, basically. And you've been heavily involved in the production of all sorts of different shows from uh, sort of guides to the night sky to, to one particularly interesting animated show uh, that's uh, very, very popular amongst the younger audience. Sure, yeah. Well, so we, we want to reach everybody. We want to, to uh, kind of hit that classic planetarium show, Guide to the Night Sky, looking at constellations, maybe uh, flying to the moon or something like that. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're doing educational and publicly uh, accessible stuff for all ages and, and, and so one of the shows that we do is TED Space Adventure and that is for small children, really small children. So it's a much, uh, it's a very different style of doing things. There is a teddy bear called TED, it's animated, uh, it's uh, simple, not with not simplistic, but, it, it, but it's simple and it's straightforward. There's some singing involved, you know, it's musical. Uh, and the idea is to, to be able to introduce small children to astronomy without it being overwhelming, without it being uh, stuff that's not really graspable by them at that stage. It's, it, it's to sort of work with them, basically. And it seems to be pretty popular. Um, we, get, we get a lot of people who are very attached to the character. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, uh, you've actually been working here at the observatory for, for, for quite a while now, it's, uh, how long is it? It's about 10 years, yeah. Yeah, and you, uh, have you seen a lot of uh, changes in the observatory over that sort of time? Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of it is simply building work, I mean, some of it's, you know, configuring the space because we are a space that is centuries old and, we're, you know, we're, we're popular, we're, we're known around the world and so there's some things which are literally about the logistics of making the place accessible. Uh, in terms of the programme, uh, or, or the programmes actually that we do for the public and for education work and schools programmes and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are constantly trying to do more and more. There's more of a throughput, I mean, in terms of number of visitors, we want to increase that all the time, but also the scope of it, the, 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 the breadth of what we can offer different people. So yeah, I, I, there's been lots of changes. Um, 
I, I would say not a massive singular change, mm -hmm. but it's the idea of trying to do something slightly better each time, or slightly more accessible, or just, just more of it, because there's some things that we do where the demand is more than our capacity, really. When did you begin to get interested in astronomy in the first place? It's a good question. I, 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 I find it difficult to answer. I, I, looking back, the more I remember about various things in my childhood, the more I realise astronomy might have been part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I have told people before that I had, and, and, and the, the memory is very hazy here, um, because I was so young, young, I think I was three, um, where I had an asthma attack, mm -hmm. and to, well, basically, I think to calm me down and distract me. I was in an ambulance going to hospital. It's a, again, it's very, very hazy memory, but I remember my mum pointing out the moon and talking to me about the moon. Now, I actually didn't remember that until uh, a few years ago, having forgotten it for a long time. Um, but I also remember things like making a little diorama of the moon, and I think my, my mum had a, a, some Associated Press type photos of, I think it's Apollo 17. I'm not entirely sure, but they were, sort of, they were photos. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but you know, I, what it seems to be is there were these kind of um, little breadcrumbs uh, perhaps laid down in my childhood. Not deliberately, I don't think I was brainwashed, but maybe. <laughs> um, and, and so it was always kind of part of my life. I, I, I think though, also, you know, I was always interested in science fiction and things. That's a gateway for a lot of astronomers um, and, and puzzle solving and things like that. And, and astronomy is a STEM subject. And so uh, when you get interested in that sort of thing, if the style of it takes you, I think it then becomes a, a matter of just which one in particular you're most interested in. Mm. And um, certainly I had a lecturer and, who became my PhD supervisor, um, who I, I remember, I mean this wasn't until I got to university, so I was already interested in astronomy, but I remember he, he, he was describing astronomy as, well it's got the, the it's all got, it's got the best stuff, it's got the superlatives, it's, it's about the fastest stuff and the most massive stuff and the most luminous stuff and uh, sort of the strongest stuff and the weirdest stuff and the furthest away stuff. So if you're really interested in things and you want the, the best aspect of it or the most extreme aspect of it, astronomy is a really interesting topic to pick because you can lose yourself in uh, things on a much grander or much smaller scale than most of other people are dealing with. So uh, where, where did you go for your degree? So I went to the University of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, the, have, they have a physics department, they have an astronomy department, they, they've now sort of organised themselves into a slightly different way of dealing uh, uh, with, with particular subjects. Um, but yeah, University of Glasgow, which was, uh, to be frank, that was a fairly local university mm. to where I grew up. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it was good. It was, uh, it's, not, it's not in the building that uh, you get to see in all the university uh, uh, adverts. Uh, university of Glasgow is a very old university, has a lovely old uh, main building, and that's not really where the physics uh, uh, department is or the maths department, but, but that's where I went, yeah. And uh, what was your degree actually on? So there were all sorts of different flavours of degree you could take, so... Sure, well I, I think this is a big thing uh, uh, for people who are maybe interested in studying, studying astronomy, because when you get to university level, courses have different names, the, the way they essentially market these, these degrees is, is a bit different. So you hear people talking about cosmology or physics with applied astrophysics or pure astrophysics or something like that. So my degree was, as it turned out, my undergraduate degree ended up being a Master's of Science, which doesn't really exist so much anymore, as opposed to a Master's in Science, slight distinction there, uh, in Mathematics and Astronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and again, this is this this is um, a confusing thing. I think this is kind of important. Personally, I feel this is important to talk to students about. Uh, so when I applied to University of Glasgow, I actually applied for physics. Um, but when you turn up, you can't just go straight into a pure physics degree. It doesn't really work like that because they need to know your maths is up to a particular level uh, and and a few other things. So the way it was set up uh, at University of Glasgow was that I was accepted to do physics, um, or possibly even physics astronomy, I can't even remember now, but I had to do some physics classes, I had to do some maths classes because they needed to make sure that I could do maths at the level that would satisfy the physics, and then I had some spare course credits left over essentially, and in theory I could have done anything. Mm. I chose astronomy as my third subject as it was sort of talked about at the time, um, and that means that I had astronomy classes, 
but in theory I was sort of under the under the call of these doing physics. Over time, I enjoyed the pure physics less and less, I enjoyed the maths more and more, and I enjoyed the astronomy more and more. So I ended up doing a slightly odd combination, which was mathematics and astronomy, um, which allows me to say that I came first in my class, but also last in my class, <laughs> because I was the only person who graduated with that particular degree. Yeah. In, in my year, so I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the first in my class, yeah, because uh, that sounds a lot better than how well I actually did. And you clearly enjoyed your degree enough, because you decided at the end of it that another three or four years uh, <laughs> doing uh, more physics, presumably, or more uh, astronomy was uh, something you wanted to do, so you chose to do a PhD. Yeah, um, I'll be honest, there's a slightly odd justification for that in that I, I did not do as well as I wanted to do. Mm. I did as well as I think I deserved to do, but I didn't do as well as I wanted to do in my undergraduate degree. I didn't put the work in, uh, uh, frankly. There were some other pro some other issues, but, but I, I, I found it very difficult to get through the honours, not necessarily the courses themselves, but, but the, the situation. And so I was a little bit disappointed and I didn't want to do some of the other things that are traditional for maths graduates and uh, astronomy graduates and physics graduates to kind of go into. So I was, I was undecided effectively um, and the PhD seemed like a good way to concentrate on things that I thought would be interesting, to do it at a high level, which I thought, well, I could give myself a bit of a kick and I can get to that level. It's, it's a struggle, but I, I, I could do it. Um, and in some ways, I mean, this, this, this makes this, I, I, I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to be talking down the, the department in any way because I did think it was a really good thing to do, but in, in some ways it felt like, well, I can put this off for another couple of years. Mm. I know that I don't want to become an accountant, for example. And lots yeah. of people do maths, they go off and do finance and stuff. I knew that I didn't want to do, or, or I knew that they didn't immediately sound appealing. And so I thought, well, this is the time because I'm not going to go back and do a PhD mm. in, as it turned out to be, gravitational wave data analysis. I'm not going to go back and do that sort of level of, yeah. of, of work. It'd be very hard to get into uh, in that sense anyway. So I thought, well, this is the time to take some time out. Because if you don't like it, you can stop. Indeed. It's not you. It's not some indentured service. You can, you can stop. But I thought, well, this is the time to do it. And the topic you chose was uh, very interesting to me uh, for your PhD. You've already mentioned it before. It was uh, gravitational wave data analysis. Data analysis, yes. yeah. Um, so basically, uh, well, uh, look, gravitational waves in a nutshell, there's, there's all sorts of analogies and they don't please everybody, so everybody's, with somebody that gets annoyed about this. But basically, if you have a massive object, an object that has mass and it moves, then it can distort space time itself. And those distortions move out at the speed of light, and so they're sometimes called ripples in space time. And again, other people don't know that that's negative. <laughs> well, we, we won't worry about that too much, but essentially, these are very, very weak. And to get anything that's even remotely detectable, you essentially need to be talking about massive objects like black holes, neutron stars, collisions between stars, that sort of thing. Um, but they're also very formidable with data analysis challenge. It's very, very on the hot. Well, it's very, very difficult to take an event like two black holes colliding and unpick what's going on based on uh, some strain data from an interferometer, which is essentially what gravitational wave observatories are mm. huge, uh, huge interferometers. You split a laser beam, you recombine it, uh, and you check whether the uh, recombination is in phase or out of phase and is, is changing phase. If, if the laser beam still lines up. Basically, if yeah. things still line up based on the actual distortion of space-time around you. Um, so the principle is pretty simple. Actually implementing it <laughs> uh, is fantastically complicated and has taken about 40 years worth of... Uh, I mean, it's been about 100 years since we've known that this was possible. It's been about 40 years of absolute, uh, you know, high-quality implementation to an eventual detection just a few years ago. Um, so data analysis is one part of it. It's, it's the bit that is perhaps a little bit hidden to people who are interested in astronomy or, or thinking about astronomy sometimes, because it's the people that are trying to unpick the data collected and work out what does that actually tell you about uh, black holes colliding or, or, or something or the other. So I didn't sit 
looking through a telescope. I didn't go and build a telescope. I was working it with data, what the data can tell you about the thing, sort of trying to invert the problem. You start with the, 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 the data coming in and you try and work out a, a picture, if you like, of what's going on. So day to day in your PhD, this would be really complex computer programming, mathematics, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, so it's it pretty computer uh, heavy and I was at my computer looking at waveforms and going, what, how do you turn that into something that I can talk to you about what, what made it? Um, so yeah, computationally heavy and mathematically heavy. Um, it was essentially what I did specifically was a, a bit like face recognition, but for black hole, black hole collision, uh, strain data, hmm. I suppose, is the way to think about it. <laughs> And, and the thing I will add in is that I was doing it based on simulated data because I was doing it based on a mission that had not flown mm -hmm. and has not flown mm -hmm. and has been reconfigured multiple times and is not even called what I used to call it uh, and might not fly for a long time yet. Mm -hmm. So in, in some, so I'm not even dealing with anything real. What, I, what you're trying to do is you're trying to set everything up so that as soon as the data starts coming, all of these other problems, or as many of the problems you might be having, have already been solved and you can already deal with. So that as soon as you actually start collecting data, you're also producing results. Going from data to results is the thing. Um, you don't want to put something up into space. This is the, the mission was an observatory that goes in space. Um, you don't want it to be in space and then realise, oh, actually we should have done A, B and C mm. because otherwise I, I don't actually know what to do with this data. Mm. You want all of that sorted so that as soon as the information comes in, you're, you're already ready working away, basically. Now, you finished your PhD in 2010. Ten. And, of course, in, what was it, September, October 2015, we actually had the news that uh, we'd actually discovered the very first gravitational wave. Sure. Uh, now, admittedly, that was a, a ground-based detector rather than the space-based one yep. that you were working on. As you said, the, the, the mission that you're working on hasn't actually launched yet. Um, but how, to, how was that to, to, uh, to find out that at least a fraction, a good fraction of your thesis it was good. <laughs> uh, it, it was really interesting. So I watched the press conference. So just as I left, there was there was potentially going to be an announcement. But what you have is so it's a very good principle. You have teams that inject data into the data pipeline, and they don't tell anybody about it. Uh, they hold the key, if you like, um, and you wait for someone else to go. There's a signal. They analyze it. Then you check with the team, and they say we injected that one. And yeah. there, was a, there was one that had just come up just as I'd finished. And so that was maybe it. And then, and then I didn't hear anything about it. Uh, uh, and so, well, okay. That, that, was a, that was either a blind injection, as, as it was, mm. or, or, or just turned out to be nothing. So when they announced the press conference several years later, and everything was giving up, I was pretty confident that they had made a detection. Mm. It wasn't like if they hadn't detected it, they would have just gone home. Oh, it doesn't really work like that. But when they made that announcement, I, or, or when the press conference was happening, I thought, it, something's happened. Um, now that could be, we've, we've proved somehow that they can't exist. And that would have been really, that would have been traumatic, I think, for a lot of people. But when they, did, when they made the announcement, it was, it was an odd feeling. I mean, it, it was relief. I wasn't in the, uh, the collaboration anymore. Um, uh, it, you know, but seeing so many people that had worked, some of them had worked their whole careers on this, um, and that was gratifying. So you finished this uh, PhD, and then did you go straight into science communication? Did you come straight here to the observatory? Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, I, I found I found the, the research difficult. I could get through it, but I had the worry that if I continued with it, I would struggle very hard, I mean, I would put the effort in, but I would find it very hard to do anything but be quite mediocre at it. Mm. Some people are very gifted at research, um, and uh, I am not, I don't think I was naturally gifted. Mm. I could put the hours in, and I could, as I say, get through it. But uh, science communication seemed like a really interesting way of still getting to, to sort of 
geek out about science and to, but 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 then actually talk to people about it um, communicate that in, literally engage the public with it and um, yeah it, it just seemed like a good way to still get to sort of play with the toys or play within the subject but also so you do something different basically and how was that moving from um a very technical subject to another technical subject running the, the planetarium, but from uh, a role that didn't require so much in the way of sort of design creativity. Creativity, sure, but not the sort of design creativity that you now have here working at the observatory. How, how did you find that and what, what attracted you to that? Well, it's quite challenging. I mean, I mean, I was interested in, in, and in particular things like public speaking and stuff like that, I was quite interested in forcing myself to do it, not because I was particularly good at it, but it would make me have to do it and get better at it. So there was the challenging myself aspect of it, but also, um, I mean, I, I find the design sort of stuff quite challenging, I, but interesting. And I thought, well, it's kind of interesting to be able to take data and present it in a way that is genuine, um, but also looks at it in a different way than, say, a research scientist looking mm. at their computer screen, looking at a waveform or something. That, that's not helpful to lots of people who don't have the, 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 the foundation yeah. to know what they're doing in the first place. So I, I find it quite an interesting challenge to present things to people. So thank you very much for coming along to do uh, this interview today. There are going to be even more of these interviews with all the rest of our team uh, on our YouTube channel. So join us again for another one soon. For now though, thank you Ed. Thanks very much for having me.